Now, for our, our last talk this for this morning session, um, we have the lovely Daniel that's going to speak for us, um, and he's going to share his experience of encephalitis. <coughs> There you are, lovely. I was panicking then. I was like, I can't see you in the room. <laughs> it is a big stage. Um, and just to remind um, our lovely audience that are online, uh, do feel free to use the Q&A box on there, ask the questions in there, and we'll do our best to respond as well throughout the day. Lovely, over to you, Daniel. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Good morning, all. It's a pleasure to be stood here in front of you all talking today. Um, it's also a privilege. And I'm also lucky to be able to do it. Um, I have some questions for those that uh, have been affected by or have uh, people that have been affected by. Um, show of hands will do uh, here today. Those online, <laughs> I presume that you're going to join in as well. How many of you were told that you or somebody close to you had encephalitis? Okay, next question is, how many of you instinctively knew that something wasn't right? <laughs> and how many of you could feel it? Okay, cool. So there's two pictures behind me. One is clearly very airbrushed. <laughs> the other is me as a young child pre uh, encephalitis. As you can see, happy, go lucky, and as my mother uh, still tells me to this day, chocolate button eyes. Um, as you would expect, I was progressing as a, a normal child would. And then uh, my family, including myself, contracted chickenpox, which for most people is pretty normal, not pleasant, but pretty normal. For me, not so much. Through chickenpox, I contracted uh, encephalitis. Um, my mother one day left me with my grandparents. Um, she came back from wherever she'd gone and said, where's Daniel? And my grandparents, rightly so, said, he's asleep on the sofa. Was I asleep? No. I had fallen into a coma. Um, obviously, I don't remember any of this, but apparently my eyes had rolled into the back of my head and I'd unfortunately sawed myself. And my mother said, this is not normal. So she phoned the doctor, we went to the doctors, the doctor said you need to take him to A&E. Now to give you some context, this was 1992, so quite some time ago, and I was presented to doctors and they suspected, which translate that is another word, guess, it was encephalitis. They didn't really know what to do with me, because in 1992 there weren't that many cases of it presented. And there wasn't a huge amount of information known about it. There still isn't, in my opinion, enough today. But they tried their best. Um, and obviously it worked, because, hello, I'm here. Um, but at the time, it was really concerning whether or not I was going to, to pull through. Um, but obviously I did. There were, however, a uh, plethora of after effects, um, some of which um, I don't remember, but I've been told uh, time and time and time again, you were a nightmare, you were this, you were that, you were the other. So I can echo some of the things that other people have said today through what I've been told, but I don't remember any of it. I'll talk about memory a little bit later on, unless I forget. Um, so after effects were things like lost learning. Um, my, my parents told me that I'd forgotten words that I'd learned. Um, there was a lot of cognitive impairment. So... And it's really challenging uh, when you, in your, in your mind and in your mind's eye, know that something is right or you feel that it's right and you're adamant that everybody else is wrong. So when I'm sat in school and you get asked the question, Daniel, what's one plus one? And I go, 11. No, that's wrong. No, it's not. One, one, 11. That was my way of thinking. It's not correct. But at the time, that in my mind is correct. And along with being told that you're wrong, despite you knowing in your every fiber of your being that you are 100% accurate, comes frustration. With that comes anger, with that comes outbursts, so on and so forth. So I went through that as a, as a young child and then through into my teenage years. Um, anger was probably my go-to default mode for everything. Um, I went from 0 to 100 like that, 
It could be over the smallest little thing. Uh, but I was just so angry with everything because I know that I'm, for want of a better expression, not ordinary. <laughs> I am extraordinary in every sense of the word. Um, and it's really difficult when you are so adamant that you're correct, you're adamant that everything you're saying is true and you have uh, an opinion on something or an idea and in your mind you make sense, everybody else is wrong, but you're being told, no, you're wrong. It's really difficult to get your head around that. Um, and as a teenager, I, I did not do well <laughs> at all at understanding that. Um, my father and I clashed, I mean, chronic, um, A, because I was a young teenage boy, and that's what young teenage boys are like, but more to the point, I wasn't able to understand things as well as some other people would. And I'd be described quite often as Hurricane Daniel, because I would have outbursts, I would create absolute chaos around me. Then the hurricane goes away, everything's calm. I walk in like nothing's happened <laughs> because I'm fine, I'm over it, but everybody else is still reeling from the effects of my outburst. It's really, really difficult to, to comprehend that. And again, you're sat there going, what's the matter with these people? Like, you know, I, I, that was 10 minutes ago, what's the matter with you? But that was my um, experience of that at the time. So being called a hurricane more, uh, more times than I care to remember. I mentioned memory. I'm remembered, that's great. <laughs> My long-term memory is fantastic. Um, people, you know, I will, I'll argue tooth and nail about long-term memory because I remember things that other people don't, even, even really seemingly insignificant details I can remember. Short-term memory, shocking. Um, I'll give you a thing I told my friend earlier on. I will lock the back door to my house. I'll walk six metres to my driveway. I can't remember if I've locked the back door. And sometimes I will physically have to go back and check, have I locked the back door? Yes, I have. What a doofus. But short-term memory really plays havoc uh, in my everyday life. It uh, drove my current partner up the wall because I'll open cupboards, forget to shut them. Not because I don't want to shut it or I'm too lazy to do so, I just forget. Or I'll leave something out on the side and I'll think, oh, I'll put that away in a minute. And then I forget. And it's really hard um, to be able to live, I suppose, life um, without annoying other people around you when you've suffered the effects uh, of this. Um, but the memory side of it is, is just a, you know, is, is a byproduct. There's nothing I can do about it. it. It is what it is. Another byproduct for me is, is fatigue. Um, I've always been tired, is the long and short of it. I'm knackered all the time. doesn't matter where I've had a busy day or a very, very quiet day. I'm always tired. I cannot get enough sleep. Um, I like to say to my partner, I'm going to go have a nap. She said, you don't nap, you sleep. I go, what, three hours? That's a nap. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> it's a sleep. But I can easily sleep for three hours a day, plus sleep eight hours overnight. I'm constantly tired. I'm fine at the moment. I'm sure probably about an hour's time, I'll be looking for the comfiest chair in the room. Um, but it's really hard because it doesn't matter what I do, where I go, what we're doing. Tiredness plays a really big part uh, in my life. Um, and again, it does affect your relationship because we've got a young son at home. If I'm sleeping, it means my partner has to look after him. It, it, yeah, it's a massive impact um, on my life. Um, fast forward to now. Um, I'm doing okay. Um, I've made, what, 30, I'm 37 years old. It was my birthday last week. Um, I had encephalitis when I was five, so I'm, I'm doing okay. There's been a lot of challenges along the way. Um, my temper was one of them. That, as I've got older, has mellowed uh, somewhat. Um, when I was younger, nah, <laughs> it was not good. Um, I just see this red mist and nothing anybody said or did could make it go away. It was down to me. Um, I think, and I will use this platform to say it, work needs to be done big time to increase awareness of this terrible affliction um, across uh, the globe, certainly in this country. I think when people apply for jobs, you fill out your application. Do you have any disabilities? I can't answer that question with a yes at the moment, because technically, I don't. But realistically, yes, I probably do. Memory being one of them. You know, your boss says to you, oh, can you do such and such? Yeah, no problem. You forget all about it. You haven't done such and such. Well, I told you to. 
yeah, anyway, I could digress and you know go on to politics and everything else. But um, I think more needs to be done uh, to increase awareness of this terrible affliction and the effect it can have on individuals, especially in the workforce, in terms of how that looks realistically. Um, for anybody that uh, does has suffered with it, my advice to you is just be open about it. Just mention it. They might ask you the question, what's that? Which a lot of people do. But just tell them, give them some background so at least you have been open and honest about it. And just, you know, when they ask, well, what do you, what do you need? What support do you need? Just tell them. Um, to summarise, I suppose, uh, what I've been talking about. Um, encephalitis is part of me. It will always be part of me. It will always affect me. It will always be my history. Um, this word's already been used, but it won't and never has defined who I am. Um, I am uh, sometimes inappropriate. My mum will attest to that. Sometimes I say things I shouldn't. Sometimes um, I will go completely off piste, off where we're talking about, but it's, that's me. You can't change that. And I would want to change that because that's who I am. Um, but I think the work that Encephalitis International are doing is fantastic. This is the first time that I've ever been involved in anything they've done. Um, because again, I was told that I had it, told that I suffered with it and told everything, but didn't, couldn't comprehend any of it until probably the age I am now. I can understand it, I can accept it, don't like it, but I am where I am, we are where we are. And I want to continue to do as much work as I can to help raise awareness of it, support those that have been affected by it. For those that have children who have been affected by it, there is hope. I'm, I'm not a shining example of that, but I'm here. I've got a secure job, I've never been out of work, I've worked since I was 16, I've got a partner, I've got a son, I've got a house, I've got a car. There's hope. Um, it's tough, um, and I say that from my, my parents' point of view. <laughs> For me, I don't remember much of it. Um, I don't remember much of my early childhood, to be fair, and I know most children don't, but, like, yeah, long, my long-term memory probably starts around the age, I would say, of about 11 or 12. Anything before that, I don't really remember it. Um, so, yeah, I speak mostly for my parents. There is hope. Um, my dad, he did really struggle with me as a child because I suppose in his eye, I've gone from being this, go happy, lucky, to this. And it's, I want to use the word, it's not normal. And for him, I think he really struggled to get his head around why I was the way I was. My mum, completely and utterly understanding, supportive, always has been, um, probably always will be. There's this, uh, there's this expression in my family, there's a golden halo above my head because I can never do any wrong. Believe you me, I can. And I've been told. But uh, thank you for listening to my journey. Um, and for those of you that have had the courage and conviction to get up so far, and for those of you that are going to, well done to you all, and keep up the good work. Thank you. a shining star oh, of hope. Thanks. Absolutely, and I think a lot of people will take inspiration from your talk today. So thank you so much for sharing your talk. No, you're welcome. And um, what would you say during that time that you were a whirlwind, a hurricane, sorry, of kind of emotion, what was, what helped you through that? What was kind of, what would you, if you look back, would you say, well, I'm so grateful? I suppose, uh, to a degree, being allowed to allowed to uh, use it in terms of rather than somebody trying to suppress it and stop it because mm -hmm. that does not work <laughs> <laughs> I speak from experience that does not work if you let it ride the storm I suppose let ride the storm let it happen uh, because d eventually you do realize that perhaps you need to bring it down and calm down and one thing that I've always been very good at is recognizing after the fact mm -hmm getting emotional, getting upset, apologizing, all of that sort of business. In the moment, you, you're, it's not going to work. There's, for me, there was no single thing or uh, way of calming me down. Mm -hmm. they just, I just had to do what I had to do, 
and then afterwards I could reflect on it, apologize and everything else. Um, but as I said, it's really hard when you've got a group of people or even immediate family members, whatever, suffering the effects of you, for them just to be able to turn off, turn off their feelings and say, oh, it's okay, it's fine, mm. is really difficult. So for me, it would, it, yeah, my advice would be, I suppose, let the storm go, let it crash thunder and lightning, everything else that goes with it. And then afterwards, be there as a support tool valid point and I think it I think that attests to that the message that encephalitis doesn't just affect the person that has encephalitis no, it's for the whole family and yeah. you know it's a journey everybody has to go on together and it's and it's hard it not, is you know. but is there any questions from the audience any comments or anything that anybody would like to ask observations they're a quiet bunch today aren't they there's nothing wrong with that <laughs> You're all reflecting. Brilliant. Um, well, thank you so much again. You're, you're around today, so I, I can come and talk to you separately and everything like that. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Let <coughs> me do this again. <laughs> there was a few of these as well when you were talking about um, the more awareness and wishing more people knew what encephalitis was. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, and we can do that together.